Hi, I'm Jeff Klein, Executive Director of the McNulty Leadership Program at Wharton. I'm here today to talk with Mario Musa, author of Committed Teams, Three Steps to Inspiring Passion and Performance. Welcome to Knowledge at Wharton, Mario. Great to be here. So, Mario, I've known you for some time, and your interests range from influence to negotiation to organizational performance. This is a, a book about teams, specifically committed teams. What led you to write this book now? Yeah. Well, for the past three years, my co-authors and I have been involved with EDP, the mm -hmm. Executive Development Program. And as you know, three times a year, EDP brings in executives from around the world, about yeah. 60 executives. And they come here, um, they, take, uh, they take courses, uh, they take sessions about uh, leadership and finance and marketing and so on. Sure. And then there's a very intense immersive simulation. And then the third part of the program is teamwork. Mm -hmm. They form into teams and they compete with each other for two weeks. Within the simulation. Within the simulation. And the environment is very realistic. So tensions run high, there's euphoria, lots of competition, lots of collaboration. Mm -hmm. The ups and downs of the ups and any downs. team. Yeah, right, exactly. So EDP really is a, um, a living laboratory in which we've had the opportunity to observe, as we like to say, 100 teams forming and competing with each other over 100 simulated years. So we like to think of this uh, living laboratory as um, an opportunity to do a lot of field work. Uh, so over that time, uh, we've gathered lots and lots of data, and all that data now is captured in our book in a framework that we call the 3 by 3 if I'm not mistaken, Mario, your two co-authors, Derek Newberry and Madeline Boyer, both come at this work from anthro anthropological training. Yeah, absolutely. So it must have been heaven for them to watch 100 teams forming uh, and evolving over time. You got it. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. So uh, Derek, Maddie were trained as anthropologists, cultural mm -hmm. anthropologists, or business anthropologists, really. And then we work with a number of other observers. We, we call this whole team, the HPT, High Performing Team Team of Got Observers. It. And most of them are trained social scientists and most of them are anthropologists. So what they excel in is observing. Uh, we love to quote that great philosopher, Yogi Berra, you can observe a lot just by watching. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the time we're not watching because we're distracted. So we've really focused in on the experience that these teams have had, as I said, forming and competing, and we've learned a lot from that. So you mentioned a, the three-by-three three framework, which has come out of these observations. Um, can you start to describe that for us a little bit? Sure. What we found is high-performing teams, uh, basically, when they're getting started on a task, focus on three things, goals, roles, and norms. Mm -hmm. So that's the first part of the three-by-three. The three. And if you look at the team's literature, you'll find versions of those basic foundations again mm -hmm. and again and again. Uh, so I wouldn't say that is all new, though we've streamlined the, the framework a little bit in that respect. But we also find that you need to, teams need to continually re revisit those foundations mm -hmm. in the three steps that right. we mentioned in, in the title. So step one is to commit to shared goals, roles, and norms. And what I hear in that is there, there's something about being explicit about what those goals, roles, and norms are. Absolutely, yeah. Explicit and having a really good conversation okay. about the, those three things. And maybe we could come back to you know, how, how you have a really yeah, yeah. good conversation. And then given that there are all kinds of pushes and pulls um, in a typical workday, so you may be, one may be on multiple teams, uh, you may be working on multiple projects, uh, you have commitments out, outside of work. How uh, are you, you describing <laughs> my life right now? <laughs> exactly. So you're distracted and mm -hmm. you're going in many different directions. And over time, naturally, almost inevitably, there's drift on yeah. teams around those, those goals, roles, and norms. So you need to revisit them. So we, um, we found that high-performing teams check in from mm. time to time. What does that look like? It's going back to those original commitments, like mm -hmm. what do we want to do, how do we want to work together, how we're going to share information, make decisions, so on and so forth. Are we still committed to those things that we initially talked about? If not, how are we going to close the gap between what we say we want to do and what we're actually doing? Okay. Which leads to the third step, which we call close. Mm -hmm. And the key activity there is closing the gap, closing the saying doing gap, 
as we like to put it. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the, the most effective way to close that gap is in small steps. Okay. Small steps uh, targeted at really specific changes um, with attention paid to the environment in which the team is working mm -hmm. and, and attempts made to create an environment that supports taking those small steps mm -hmm. and then being realistic about what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, we like to say realistic optimists do better than pure optimists because realistic optimists think ahead about what can get in the way of doing mm -hmm. what they want to do. So um, the three by three, you know, in sum, uh, is initial conversation about goals, roles, and norms, mm -hmm. and then checking in from time to time, and then working to close the gap between what you're actually doing and what, what you say you want to do. And then doing that again and again and again, and that's right. an iterative process. And the, and the key to doing that well is having a really good conversation or really paying attention to what's happening on the team. And it turns out that it's really hard to pay pay attention. Yeah, to. absolutely. I mean, as I think about it, um, you know, the, the teams that I'm a part of now, the teams that I've been a part of, kind of flash through my mind, and I'm I'm aware that in some of those teams, those conversations felt like they were easier, they were expected. In other teams, they were much harder. Right. Um, what suggestions do you have for for leaders of teams, for teammates? who want to make sure that they're able to have these kinds of check-in conversations. Yeah, yeah. So three things that, um, that I would offer as guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, one is pay attention to style. So we all have different styles of different kinds. Like mm -hmm. Some of us are extroverted, some introverted. Some of us love conflict, some of us don't, and, and so on. So, I'm going for kind of a <laughs> rustic dapper style. Uh, and you, you pull it off very <laughs> well. Uh, so have a conversation about styles. Uh, two, have one-on-ones. You know, the mm -hmm. best way to build relationships, or a very helpful way to build relationships, is through one-on-one -on -one, uh, dialogue. Not that you don't want to have group dialogue as well, but right. if you just have group dialogue, sometimes the group dynamics become so complex, yeah. uh, it's just hard to manage. So you're them. building trust more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I would say uh, focus on a few things versus a lot of things. Right. Uh, and you know, teams typically get overwhelmed or often get overwhelmed because they're just trying to do too much or mm -hmm. their goals are too big. Uh, so keep it simple, keep it, uh, keep it manageable. And that helps then uh, that if you do all those things, you tend to have a better conversation mm -hmm. uh, than if you're, you're not – paying attention to how you talk to each other, and you're not simplifying the things that you talk about. As you, uh, as you and your colleagues observe teams within the executive development program, did any, um, any ratio or relationship between kind of working time and check-in time emerge? Is there, you know, do you have guidelines uh, for yeah. team leaders yeah. about how to think about yeah. that? Yeah, really good question. Uh, so I want to give the answer, the classic uh, consultant answer. It depends. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> uh, so it really does depend. Mm -hmm. uh, some teams have a huge appetite for process mm -hmm. and talking and have a huge need for that. Uh, so they'll probably take more time right. with, with check-ins. Uh, some have more of a get-it-done sort of attitude and maybe are a little bit impatient. Right. And they're going to take less time for the, for the check-ins. But the, but the really important point is to have check-ins yeah. uh, and then use your judgment as to what's most helpful, you know, how much time you want to spend on the check-ins. Now, Mario, I'd imagine um, over 100 teams that, that you and your colleagues have observed, uh, I'd imagine that you witnessed some common errors or common mistakes that teammates, teams can fall into. Do you want to maybe outline a few of those? Yeah, sure. Uh, a few, yeah, and uh, yeah, we've I, we've identified a few, and we talk about them right. in, in the book. But one would be relying too much on one person. Okay, uh, we call that the you know the great person theory. <laughs> uh, so there may be one person who has a really strong vision, who has a dominant personality, or for one reason or another. Uh, uh, sends the message they can do it all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's you. It's almost always a big mistake to focus too much on on one person. Uh, another mistake that teams commonly make is focusing too much on simply a plan mm -hmm. and not thinking about how to execute the plan mm -hmm. and organizing people uh, around that uh, around that plan. 
Uh, and that, I imagine, ties right back into the discussion around roles. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you anticipated something that I, the next thing that I wanted to say, which is that uh, another mistake that teams make is not paying enough attention to roles. Mm. Uh, so let's say they have a good discussion about their goals. They're all behind their, their goals. And then they say, let's go off and, and do it. If they don't have a conversation about who's going to do what, in other words, roles, uh, then usually they just don't maximize the, uh, their efforts. Right. Uh, you know, so um, roles, uh, not paying enough attention to execution, focusing too much on one person, those are some common errors that we see. In the book, you describe uh, a, a trend that we see in the workplace, that we see uh, certainly in universities as well, and that is this reliance on teams to get things done. Um, we are all members of multiple teams now. So what's the kind of work that's really well suited to a team? And, yeah. And are, is there a kind of work that maybe a team's not best suited to? Yeah, work? yeah, great question. Um, I think um, that's a really important question, and I think probably it's not asked enough mm -hmm. uh, these days. So there's lots of evidence that, generally speaking, groups don't maximize their, their potential because, right. they, you know, because they don't organize well. And often groups take on tasks that should be done by individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, tasks that require specialized expertise or highly creative tasks. Um, let, let's say uh, writing, a, like writing a poem or a symphony, but in a work right. setting, it might be writing a report. Right. Uh, so those sorts of tasks probably should be done okay. uh, by an individual. And then also when time is really short, you may want to have one person just do a task because individuals tend to be more efficient than, mm -hmm. than, uh, than groups. On the other hand, when you're working on a problem that requires multiple perspectives, uh, multiple sources of expertise, that's probably when you want to work with a team and you know, apply the basic steps that we've been talking about. Right. There's such pressure uh, within organizations today to achieve. Um, yet at the same time, we know that teams need to be building capacity for the future. Uh, what did you find and what advice do you have about how to manage that tension? Yeah. Know when to go fast and know when to go slow. Okay. Uh, you know, Dan, Can uh, Dan Kahneman published a great book a few years ago called Thinking Fast and Slow. Absolutely. And uh, we like to say there's a lot of wisdom in that. So uh, when you need to go fast, maybe don't pay so much attention to mm -hmm. team process. Uh, but when, uh, when team process is really important, you know, when you need to pull in multiple perspectives, for example, that's when you want to slow down and be deliberate about how the team forms and how the team has its conversations. Right. And, and I, I want to take us, as we start to wrap up our time here, um, back to the beginning of the conversation where you were talking about this process of committing and checking in. Um, Within the book, you talk about the concept of psychological safety for team members. Um, why is that? What is that, first of all? And then why is it important to, uh, to this three-by-three three framework? Sure. Yeah. Most of the time, uh, people do not speak their, their minds. We know that from lots and lots of research. So, you know, well over half the time, people are not sharing what they're thinking and feeling. Even on camera? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, so, um, you know, the more information you have, the better your decisions are going to be, the better your collaboration is going to be. So creating an environment where people feel uh, that they're able to share their thoughts, in other words, where they feel safe, in other words, where their psychological safety turns out to be really important. And if I were going to focus on one thing, um, I think it would be that, creating an environment of psychological safety. And how do you do that? That goes back to some of the things we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. building trust, having good one-on-one -on -one uh, conversations, yeah. uh, listening, mm -hmm. uh, showing empathy, showing that you care. Um, so this apparently soft factor of psychological safety uh, plays a big role in delivering results. I like to say that the soft stuff is the hard stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, um, you, uh, in my final question, I um, want to ask you to do a little bit of reflection, if I can. Sure. Um, you wrote about teams in a team. Mm -hmm. Right. And and so how did your partnership with Derek and Madeline, um, how did that evolve and how did you use the check in process? Sure. Over time? Yeah. Well, being on a team is like being in a committed relationship. Yeah. 
Uh, you can't just phone it in. It never works. So um, we were clear about what we wanted to do. We wanted to write a book that was helpful to leaders making decisions in a, in a, in a team environment. We were clear we wanted to speak to a wide audience. Uh, we liked how each other wrote. Um, we have compatible styles. And when things weren't working out, we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always nice when we get to live our work, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Mario, thank you so much for being here today with Knowledge at Wharton. Thank you. It was a lot of fun.